it's our extreme pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Harvey Feinberg to deliver this year's Alan Bernstein Distinguished Lecture. This is our 10th Alan Bernstein Lecture that honors Dr. Bernstein as the founder of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and that honors scientific excellence and a spirit of ingenuity in the circulatory and respiratory sciences. Dr. Feinberg hails from Pittsburgh but spent most of his training and early career at Harvard University in Boston, but we won't hold that against him. So uh, Harvey has a very broad expertise and I was amazed to read in his CV that he managed to be a teacher at the Kennedy School of Government te teaching political analysis while working in a community health clinic. And uh, Harvey is the president of the Institute of Medicine for the last 10 years. Prior to that, he was a member of and then dean of the Harvard School of Public Health for 13 years, following which he was the uh, provost of Harvard University uh, for four years. And uh, as far as I can tell, that means you do all the work of the dean or the, uh, the president of the university. Um, he has devoted most of his academic career to the fields of health policy and medical decision making. And his research has focused on policy development and implementation an assessment of medical technology, uh, evaluation in the use of vaccines, and dissemination of medical innovations. So he's written very extensively on how medicine and medical science influences public health. So when I read that in some of his writings, I thought what a perfect introduction to our two-day symposium on how the biology of cardiovascular, pulmonary, and metabolic disease intersect with environmental and other risk factors and how our understanding of this intersection should lead to new treatments and prevention of disease and promotion of health. Alan Bernstein, in his own career, uh, did establish this set of principles of working simultaneously uh, at the forefront of science and also contributing at the levels of policy and institutional leadership. And I think the role of scientists today as not only those who are discovering new truths of nature, but also responsible for communicating to the larger public and to policymakers both the content and the implications of that science is an inevitable and unavoidable part of today's role of science. We depend in science on the support of the public. So many of the major problems that our nations face individually and collectively also depend on informed science, engineering, medicine, technical expertise across a spectrum of fields, whether we're dealing with questions of energy, or transportation, or prosperity, or health, or education. Anywhere you look today in the domains of policy making that matter to people, you find that expertise, science, evidence, must be brought to bear to make informed and superior decisions. That is a very important function. And the question that I want to talk with you about today is how do we organize ourselves to do that successfully? What does it take? How well does it work? What makes it work well or what may be some of the difficulties in bringing science to bear on policy making. I'm here as the president of the U.S. Institute of Medicine. Uh, some of you may be familiar in general uh, with the work of the Institute. I'll be saying a bit about the background of uh, its context. Uh, but every country must deal with these questions. And in fact, I would say uh, there's some very good examples where for Canadian U.S. common interest, interestingly, especially in the area of nutrition. There's a long tradition of collaboration around working together on establishing dietary reference intakes, assessments of nutrient values, and the importance of everything from vitamin D to uh, amounts of sodium in the diet that uh, we have undertaken jointly with, uh, with Canadian colleagues to inform policymakers uh, on both sides of the border uh, about these questions. But today I want to take a step back to think a little bit more broadly about the organization of scientists, physicians, 
engineers and other experts in the form of associations that can most effectively bring to bear the benefits of that expertise uh, to contemporary science. Now, in many countries, uh, most of these are represented. I think I have to advance the slide. Good, OK. Now, national academies in different countries uh, have origins going back uh, hundreds of years. But it, you cannot tell by the title of uh, an academy or an institute in a country exactly what it's about and what it does. You have to look behind the name to understand what it is. Many countries of the world have these, for the most part, an academy of science or medicine or engineering is primarily organized around being a recognition of its members as an honorific association. Some of them, uh, and in particular the examples I'll talk about, have also a very distinct advisory function. Uh, here in Canada, there's been a lot of debate about uh, the ways to organize most effectively these functions. I don't know if you are familiar with the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, uh, which is a relatively new effort to bring together uh, scientists and experts in health uh, to form some of the same advisory functions uh, similar to those I'll be talking about. Uh, but they stand in addition to many other associations in Canada. Uh, as there are in, uh, in other countries. And these vary in the scope of the fields that they cover. Some of them include the humanities. Some are limited to science. Uh, in China, uh, the Academy of Engineering includes a component of, uh, of medicine. Uh, in different countries, like in Russia, the Academy of Sciences is actually the equivalent of the combination of the honorific association and the operating scientific agency. It manages thousands of employees and laboratories all over uh, the country. Uh, in France, uh, the academy uh, especially is such that uh, it's very limited in the number. Someone has to die before someone else is elected uh, to take their place. So it's a very restricted association. So. Uh, they vary all over the world, and you, you have to look behind the facade to understand what do they do and what is their role, either in research or in policy uh, advising. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the difference between the traditional science academy and the activist science academy. This cartoon by Carlton Stoiber was intended to illustrate uh, the difference. We like to think, uh, in the US at least, at the Institute of Medicine, uh, that we try to keep uh, both eyes open uh, most of the time. Uh, but uh, the academies can sometimes be seen as rather uh, sleepy places in the backwaters, apart from these contemporary issues of policy and challenge. Now, in the US context, it was in the crucible of war that the US National Academy of Sciences was founded, particularly in the US Civil War in the 1860s. In 1863, the Congress of the United States chartered a new National Academy of Sciences. And from the very beginning, at the establishment of this academy, it was put together for the purpose of being useful, not merely being an adornment of recognition. But it was established for the express purpose, as the charter says, whenever called upon by any department of government to investigate, examine, and report on any subject of science or art. Now, in the context of the 1860s, the word art uh, was uh, the applied arts, what we would today perhaps uh, uh, describe as technology. But that was the uh, terminology of the day. And here's an interesting addition. But the academy shall receive no compensation whatsoever for any services to the government of the United States. Very interesting principle established at the outset. I believe most likely as a reaction uh, to the price gouging that was going on at the time by those who were exploiting the war to provide armaments and materiel for the uh, forces that were needed. Uh, and this was a reaction to that to say, we are not interested in the government's money. We are doing this as a public service. And from this original charter derived the key principles 
for the U.S. context of the National Academy of Sciences that have really resonated through the decades up to this very day. First, the Academy was established independently of the government. Legally in the United States, uh, we at the Institute of Medicine, as a part of our National Academies, we are a 501c3, as it is called, a private, nonprofit, charitable organization. That's our, our legal standing. But we're founded with this idea of providing advice to any agency of government that needs it, and we have broadened it in a way that I'll describe shortly. We depend on the volunteer willingness of individuals to serve, to give of their expertise. And at the Institute of Medicine, I can tell you every year more than 2,000 individuals participate as volunteers in one or another of the projects and studies that are underway uh, in, a, in a given year. And finally, uh, the Academy is designed to choose from a broad cross-section and to include a broad cross-section of expertise and involvement in its work. Now, I want to say just a word about the early studies of the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences in the, in the 1860s. The very first request that came to the Academy came from uh, Salmon Chase, who was then the Secretary of the Treasury. And he asked the academies to look into the question of the most appropriate weights, measures, and coins for the United States of America for both domestic and international commerce. Now, this study began uh, in 1863, and it established a pattern that we've been trying to avoid ever since. It went three times as long as it should, and it had no effect whatsoever. What the committee decided after three years in examining systems all over the world was, you'll be shocked to hear this, that the metric system was the best suited system for international weights and measures. And I would say 150 years later, it would be millimetrically precise to say we are still waiting for the United States to adopt the recommendations of the committee. Now, there were other work uh, in that first decade that was perhaps uh, somewhat more timely and effective. The Department of the Navy at that time was uh, embarking on a new era of ironclad warships, uh, the famous Battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack during the Civil War was the first battle of two ironclad warships. And a lot of questions came up. For example, how do you stop the iron from rusting when it's sitting in the ocean? What do you, what do you coat it with? And another very important question, how do you navigate with compasses that are in an iron surround and get distracted by the iron? And the National Academy of Sciences actually came up with solutions to both problems in terms of balancing the magnetic forces and in terms of coatings for the hulls of ships. Uh, so there were some good experiences in that first uh, decade as well as some that uh, don't give us a, a lot of confidence. Now to step forward rather quickly to the organization today, uh, the, there are three elective academies in the U.S. that form a common legal entity. The National Academy of Sciences was the first established in 1863, as I've described. The National Academy of Engineering uh, started in, in 1964, and then the Institute of Medicine uh, began operating with a program of work in 1970. So we're just over 40 years uh, as an institute uh, of medicine. Today we describe the mission of the Institute of Medicine as serving as advisor to the nation to improve health. We characterize ourselves as an independent nonprofit organization working outside of government to provide unbiased and authoritative advice to, to decision makers and to the public. And we describe our mission as embracing the health of people everywhere. Just as a snapshot, I mentioned about 2,000 volunteers each year there are elected to the Institute of Medicine uh, uh, more than 1,800 members. 
There are a small number of foreign associates who are elected each year. That number, uh, as of a modification to the charter, looking ahead, will double from five to 10 maximum uh, every year. One of the very interesting features of the membership of our institute from the outset, the founders believed that the issues of health were too complicated and demanding and diverse to leave only up to the doctors. And very interestingly, they required that the membership be comprised of at least 25% from outside of the health professions. Not doctors, not nurses, not pharmacists, but people from outside, lawyers, humanists, administrators, economists, others who could bring expertise to bear on the questions of health, but did not come from within the health profession. And a very important principle for us from the beginning is that the Institute of Medicine was organized to work on problems of health, not to represent the interests of the health profession. Others do that. And that distinction is a very important determinant, I believe, of the longer term uh, success. Every year, the Institute produces about 60 reports and summaries of, uh, of workshops and other activity. So on average, it's about one a week uh, that is produced. Some of these have rather immediate uh, effect, and I'll talk a little bit more about the principles, but one recently, you may have heard about this uh, dust up in the United States recently over the coverage of contraception for women in health insurance. Have you heard about uh, this story, and particularly the uh, student who testified before a group and then was lambasted uh, by a conservative commentator, and it's a big uh, kind of uh, continuing tempest uh, in, the, in the U.S. today. Well, the reason that all got started, the Affordable Care Act, which was enacted last uh, year uh, in the United States, includes a provision that says that preventive services shall be covered by insurers without copayment and without deductibles, fully covered. And then the question came up exactly what preventive services are to be covered. The law provides that all under recommendations of a preventive services task force, but the Secretary of Health and Human Services asked the Institute of Medicine last year to look especially at those services that women may require as preventive services that are not universally required and to recommend those which should be included. And that committee did its work, came forward with eight recommendations, one of which was contraception. The secretary adopted that recommendation and issued the guidance within a matter of weeks and left unfinished the question or unsettled the question about religious institutions that have a moral objection to contraception and how that's to work out. And that's what got this whole uh, latest episode started. But uh, it will, I think, sort out. Uh, and it's a very interesting lesson in the way uh, policy uh, can evolve and be challenged at different stages. Uh, maybe we'll have a chance to talk more about that uh, in the Q&A if it's of interest. Now, I want to emphasize some ways in which uh, our circumstance is distinctive in the context of U.S. Uh, uh, councils and expertise. First, we do operate under this charter from the Congress. So it's a very interest, interesting privileged position in which you're chartered by the government but outside uh, of government. And that lack of affiliation with any government agency is for us at least a very important protector of independence. There's no direct appropriations to the Institute of Medicine or to the National Academies from our Congress. There's no money that automatically goes each year to underwrite the expenses. Now, I have to confess, when I started at the Institute of Medicine 10 years ago, I thought this was a terrible oversight. I mean, we are there designed to provide guidance and advice to the government. Shouldn't we have a core fund that would support every year uh, the work? 
And then a few years later, when we had done uh, the tenth in our series of reports on vaccine safety, and the last report was on autism, and the finding of the committee that there was no evidence that vaccines were related to autism, despite a lot of public concern about this. One member of Congress whose grandchild had uh, developed autism and who was convinced it was due to vaccine, turned to a staff member and said, bring me the budget of the Institute of Medicine. And when an hour later the staffer could return and say there is no budget, for us that's a very good answer. So it means that the Institute is, however, dependent on project by project contracting. Ultimately today, about 60% of our annual program budget of about 50 million US does derive from contracts specifically undertaken with different government agencies. The 40% comes from foundations, individual supporters, and others who uh, want to help uh, carry out the work. But this lack of a line budget is a very important uh, protector of independence and ability to render uh, free uh, judgments. The Institute encompasses all manner of health policy, uh, whether we're talking about uh, nutrition or child health, elder health, traumatic brain injury, chronic disease, acute infections, evaluation of programs abroad or at home, the Institute of Medicine is prepared to undertake an appropriate study of an area that rises to a level of significance. We, f we do our best to remain apolitical beyond bipartisan. It's not that we try to balance political interests, we try to stay above the political fray. We try to let evidence and science do the speaking. We have a very interesting protection under the U.S. law. There's a, there's a law in the United States that's called the Federal Advisory Committees Act. This is basically a sunshine law for federal agencies. It says mostly that if you are a federal agency and you want to form a group to give you advice and you want to use that advice to set your own policy, you must have that group hold all of its meetings in public, in the open, where anyone can hear whatever anyone has to say. But in the law, there's a special provision called Section 15, which says to the agency, by the way, if you turn to the Institute of Medicine or the National Academies, you can let them use their process and you can use the results for your policy making, even though some of their deliberations will be held in executive session. Our policies provide for our committees to be able to deliberate also in private as well as in, in public, because we want to ensure that individual members can speak their mind without concern that it's going to show up in the newspaper uh, the next day, or be able to change their mind without explaining publicly why they might have said something once and then later have changed their mind. All of our reports, of course, are public. All of the materials that are submitted to the committee are held in a public file. Every member of the committee is vetted very carefully for what we call conflict of interest, which is mainly financial interest and bias, which means you have a preformed view on the subject, which a lot of experts naturally have. We try to eliminate conflicts and we try to balance biases and expose them. But the Federal Advisory Committees Act further provides in that section that once an agency turns a question to the institute or the academies, it may not in any way interfere with the work of the academy. And that is set up as a way of preventing the agency from using this as a workaround to the exposure just by getting its answer that it wants. And instead, it provides an added measure of protection to our academy to protect us from influence from a government agency. And I can tell you in 10 years that I've been a president of the Institute of Medicine, never once has any government officer uh, attempted to 
influence by contacting me anything about a study that was underway. That, I cannot say the same for my academic colleagues. I can, however, say that the, uh, the, the government uh, agents are quite scrupulous in obeying uh, this law. And finally, a very important provision, practical provision for us, uh, is that any agency that wishes can directly contract with us without competitive bid. And by the same token, we do not compete on any competitive contract. The theory being, if anyone else is able to do it, we're not designed to do it. So it's only when, when uh, the government agency or others feel that it's necessary to have the independence and expertise of the Institute that we get uh, engaged in it. Now, this is my favorite demonstrator. I don't know if he's Canadian, but he has the right idea. What do we want, evidence-based change, when do we want it after peer review? How seldom do we see that kind of demonstration, but it's exactly what it is that we are after. Now, I just want to highlight a variety of types of products that we produce, the reports that I've mentioned, derivatives that uh, we talk about, which are, uh, which are briefs, which are all of these, by the way, available on any subject that we've covered uh, for free as downloads on the PDF from the Institute of Medicine website, if you're interested in any projects, workshop summaries, uh, and uh, uh, another very interesting uh, venture that we have on what we call perspectives, which are individually authored pieces related to the work uh, of the Institute. We're concerned with uh, reaching the right audiences. This is actually a woodcut of uh, Michael Faraday speaking uh, before the Royal uh, Institution, and apparently I'm told Prince Albert and his sons were somewhere in this audience. So it, it, it's an example of science speaking to power, uh, but the key here is knowing in each instance who it is you are trying to reach, and it depends on the content and message and what it is you're trying to affect. Is it to the public at large? When we have a study that talks about mammography, part of our audience is the public at large. When we have studies on quality and safety in healthcare, part of our audience are health professionals and leaders of health institutions. When we have studies on genomics, part of our audience are the practicing scientific community. When we have studies on policy making with relation to HIV or lung disease or any other condition, then our audience may also include legislators and policy makers. Now, when I started at the Institute of Medicine, before I actually took office, I sat down with the senior staff and I said to them, could you give me some examples, could you go talk with your colleagues, collect some examples of the best studies that the Institute has done so I can learn from those. So they went off and about an hour later they came back and knocked on the door and uh, the deputy executive officer was the one, he came in uh, and he said, uh, I have a question. I said, what's the question? He said, what exactly do you mean by best? So I said, well, what do you mean, what do you mean by best? He said, well, do you mean best in the sense of those studies that are technically excellent, methodologically sound, and well-reasoned from the evidence? Or do you mean the studies that had the greatest effect on the world? So I said, oh, those are not the same. He said, no, not exactly. I said, well, of course, give me both lists. So I got both lists, and I'm, I'm happy to report that there was some overlap. <laughs> but I can tell you they're not identical. And that's a very important realization. I've come to appreciate that what is it that when we do that will make a study successful in terms of its excellence? It will depend on six key ingredients. How clear and appropriate is the question that we've asked? What's the charge? How good is the chair, the qualifications and abilities to enable a group to succeed? Have we put the right committee together with expertise and breadth? Do we have a staff person with the right experience and ability to enable others, the committee, to do their work? Did we put together enough money to carry the project through to the end? And did we 
give ourselves the right amount of time, short enough to keep the pressure on, long enough to do the job. Now, a successful study is not the same as impact, as I've just described. So I also asked from the beginning, well, how do we judge impact? You might think about that. What does it mean to have an impact from your work? What matters to you? Does it matter that you, well, first that the, the experiment is a success and then you've published? Is that the impact you're after? Is that enough? Is it that it contributes to your next job, to your promotion? Is that the impact? Do you care whether it contributes to other science? Do you have a larger aspiration? These are the kind of analogous questions that we were asking about our own work which is not easy to tell. I will tell you that I went through my, let us call it, more, pure, more purely quantitative phase of assessment, and I came to see that really you had to look both at qualitative and quantitative aspects of impact if you wanted to have a more complete picture. And we've developed a kind of hybrid system. We metaphorically use a thermometer with degrees of impact, and I won't go through these, but it basically goes from the uh, lower level of where you have disseminated your message and people have uh, gotten the word all the way up through the information to the field, inspiring action on the part of the several actors, and finally effecting change in the world with ultimate uh, health outcomes, which in the population that we care about. Now, this is my sense of what it is that matters to whether the study has actually had an impact. It is true that how good the study is technically can make some difference, but I can tell you that sometimes what we call eminence-based studies as opposed to evidence-based studies can have a very large impact even if they're not as thoroughly grounded in the evidence. I tell my staff the reason to make a study technically excellent is not because that guarantees it will have an effect in the world. Rather, it's because just in case it does have an effect, you want it to have been right. And that's a very important motivation to get it right. It does matter especially how timely and important the study is. When the secretary needs an answer about the coverage for preventive services, that report is going to be acted on in a matter of weeks. Another study that can tell the world how to more appropriately price drugs for malaria might take four years, as it did, before it would be adopted by the World Bank and others because it didn't have the same press of timeliness. It was important, but it didn't have the same immediate press. How well something will be taken up does depend on interests and values. I'll just say a word about a study uh, related to tobacco smoke and tobacco uh, use. Uh, there are a lot of contending interests there in food and dietary restrictions, lots of contending interests uh, there. When you're dealing with something like confronting tuberculosis, not so many contending interests. The tubercle bacillus doesn't hire very many representatives to represent its interests. But if you're talking about air pollution, there are a lot of contending interests that are gaining by the ability to push the cost and the health consequences off onto others. How well did we communicate the results? And a really interesting to me insight is the idea of repetition. Very seldom does a single one-off study make all the difference. You have to repeat, and it's true in science, and it's true in policy, if you want to have uh, an effect. Oftentimes, that's what's required. Not always, but often. Now, I just wanted to give a couple of examples. Uh, we were told that in Canada, the adult smoking frequency is now down to about 14%, 14 to 14 14.5%. The United States is still up around 20%. In the United States, we uh, have continued very little to decline, but much less rapid decline than we had since the 1960s until 
2000. You know the first U.S. Surgeon General's report on tobacco came out in the mid-1960s, and that really turned uh, the corner to begin uh, the changes. But the question that our committee was asked is, how do we end tobacco as a health problem? How do we make tobacco history rather than a continuing and lingering problem? It's tied up with addiction. It's tied up with commercial interests. It's tied up with habit. It's tied up with many elements, and a very good committee uh, came together to say we've got to reach new levels of intensity in policy making and change at community levels to national levels to deal with this problem. And starting next summer in the United States, we're going to see new packaging uh, that the Food and Drug Administration has insisted on, where at least half of the fronts of tobacco packages will have very explicit and vivid warnings about the dangers of uh, tobacco smoke. Another study I thought might be of interest to the group is one that looks at cardiovascular health in the developing world. This was a study that attempted to take the lessons learned throughout the world and apply it particularly to the challenge of chronic disease uh, and particularly cardiovascular disease in the developing world. Oftentimes we think about the problems of health in the developing world as being infectious disease problems, but simply because a country that is poor has a much higher proportion of its people dying from infection does not mean that it cannot simultaneously have a higher proportion of people dying from cardiovascular disease, which many poor and middle income countries do. And as the problem of tobacco becomes more widespread in the world, it's a growing problem, not a diminishing problem. And as air pollution continues to be such a serious problem, we must have a global strategy, which our committee advocated and is still continuing to advance on dealing with cardiovascular health in the world. Um, I will just say that uh, the recommendations from this group uh, do embrace the need for new uh, science, particularly uh, in the interface and translation from lab to field, but also emphasize the importance of local solutions and being realistic about the resources that can be mobilized to deal with the problems. I just wanted to highlight here that I hope you'll take your uh, advantage of the opportunity to scan the Institute of Medicine website to look for reports and other areas of work that may be of interest to you. I would just conclude by saying that from our vantage point, I think the reasons why we try to have success over time are twofold. First is this very distinct relationship to the government. Metaphorically, I describe it as arm's length tightly clasped, connected to the issues and concerns of the policymaker, but keeping your distance. And finally, and above all, the processes, procedures, and other ways that you can protect the integrity of the reviews and the in integrity of the science that underlies those reviews is all that stands behind the credibility and influence of the enterprise. And in the long run, it is the credibility and the integrity of the science that will make all the difference for health, for heart, for lung, for health in every domain, in Canada, in the U.S., and in every country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Eagle, an eagle-eye view of uh, health in the world. Um, John has the first question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cairns. Uh, unfortunately, the mic arrived just as you finished, so could, any, could, you, could you hear the question or should I, could you all hear it all right? Good. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you for your comment on the, on the Canadian Academy for Health Sciences. One of the things I personally have valued the most has been the opportunity to work with colleagues in other countries who are uh, attempting to bring science to bear on questions of direct interest there. And I think that's a wonderful uh, example, and I'm, I'm very thrilled to see uh, it, uh, it taking on uh, the standing and work that it has. 
what I would say on the response to the specific question of the balance between assessment of evidence and recommendations, this is, a, this is actually a matter of active contention uh, in a continuing and I think very vital way, even within our national academies as, uh, uh, as with outside. We have had examples in the US of organizations that were expressly, uh, I will almost say prohibited from offering recommendations. For example, we had something called the Office of Technology Assessment established by the US Congress and it lasted for about 15 years. And in its lifetime, what it did is assemble the evidence, assess the scientific validity, and then lay out options, but never make a recommendation. What we tell our uh, committees in the Institute of Medicine is that they do not have to feel compelled to make recommendations. However, virtually every study that we undertake is done with a set of questions. And we do then uh, expect our committees to answer the questions to the best of their ability, qualified as they may be, and uh, to express their advice in the form of recommendations. I have come to understand also that recommendations can be poorly or well formulated. And by and large, if you're ever in an entity where a, a, a recommendation is expressed in the passive voice, you're in trouble. Because the passive voice does not declare who is to do what. It just says something is to be done. So a well-formed recommendation has an actor, an action, and a time frame. And it may also have uh, options, if there are different ways to achieve it, or it may describe alternatives rather than give a specific recommendation. The Institute of Medicine interfaced with the FDA in defining policy. Uh, and the answer is uh, frequently and sometimes uh, to, a, to good effect. For example, the study I showed about uh, tobacco, when the FDA, which then got authority to, uh, uh, to deal with tobacco, which was again one of, that, one of the recommendations, uh, when, they, uh, when they put forward their rules on warnings, they cited the report of the Institute of Medicine uh, with that recommendation as a basis for it. On medical devices in particular, uh, we had a committee that reported last year on what in the U.S. is called the 510K process. This is a, uh, a basis on which the FDA can review medical devices that are uh, put forward uh, by the manufacturers as being essentially equivalent to another device and therefore uh, it's a more rapid uh, review and a number of the uh, now problematical uh, devices uh, such as the hip implants and some cardiac uh, device questions that have been raised uh, were devices that actually had gone through the 510K uh, process initially. And a question that the FDA asked the Institute of Medicine was how could the 510K process be made uh, more effective so that uh, it would protect safety and still not uh, delay uh, the adoption and dissemination of the um, uh, necessary devices. And in that instance, uh, our committee basically came back and said, uh, you cannot use the 510K process to enhance safety. It simply is not suited to that task. Uh, now, I don't think the FDA will immediately take up that particular part of the recommendation. Other parts of the analysis, I think, were uh, directly uh, adoptable by the FDA at that time. Uh, but the FDA needs, uh, needs really, in my opinion, a way of, uh, of uh, assuring safety and also allowing the devices which are effective to be used. In my personal opinion, this is not from an IOM report, uh, I think that a big part of this is going to be thinking afresh about staging of device use and availability rather than a single on-off switch, it's unapproved and then it's approved and can be used everywhere. All right, well, I'd like to thank you again for that wonderful talk and uh, we'll have time for further discussion with Harvey later. So we'd like to present you with a piece of uh, British Columbia First Nations wow. 
art, and this is a, a talking stick, and I'm, I'm not sure you're actually in need of a bigger stick, but uh, this is meant to honor the person that's, that's holding it. Uh, so if you're having a meeting where you want to uh, make sure every person in the room gets honored, you can, you can hand them the stick, and, th and they get to uh, be, the, be the only one who speaks at that time. So, wow. so thank you for honoring us today.